Good evening. Our text this evening is found in John's Gospel, John chapter 1. I've entitled the message, The Mystery of the Incarnation. We've sung these words already, the words of Charles Wesley, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Please turn, if you will, then to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. You will find it on page 886 in the Pew Bible before you. Hear then God's holy word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light, the true light which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. But he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John Calvin said, the Son of God miraculously descended from heaven, yet in such a manner that he never left heaven, he chose to be miraculously conceived in the womb of the virgin, to live on the earth and to be suspended on the cross. And yet he never ceased to fill the universe in the same manner as from the beginning. The mystery of the incarnation. How does that work? It is a mystery and it is a mystery not a mystery that we shall, in a detective sort of fashion, try to unravel and give solutions and answers to tonight. But it is a mystery that is given to us in God's holy word that we may stand in wonder and awe and worship of our wonderful Savior and all that he has done for us. Let us pray. Our Father, as we look now at this portion of Scripture and as we contemplate the glorious truth of the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that you would speak to our hearts afresh, that you would teach us, that you would show us from your word what great things our Savior has done and accomplished for us and on our behalf. We praise you in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. What is the Incarnation? The doctrine of the Incarnation instructs us in several areas, and we want to see from our text this evening, from, from John chapter 1, first, who Christ is. He is the Word. We want to see what Christ did, that the Word was made flesh. Where Christ went, the Word was made flesh, and he dwelt among us and what Christ gives, and we beheld his glory. The incarnation refers to the act of the pre-existent second person of the Trinity, the Son of God becoming a human being. Gospel birth narratives of Matthew and Luke are often the focus of sermons and hymns during this time of year. We sing about the baby in the manger, and rightly so. But we must always remember that the baby of the manger is none other than the eternal second person of the Godhead. Christmas is about 
the incarnation of Jesus. When we strip away the season's hustle and bustle, the trees, the decorations, the cookies, the commercialism, family gatherings, what remains is a humble birth story and a simultaneously stunning reality. The incarnation of the eternal Son of God. This incarnation, God himself becoming human, is a glorious fact that is too often neglected or forgotten amidst all the gifts and get-togethers and pageants and presents. Therefore, we do well to think about the incarnation as the season fast approaches. He, the second person of the Godhead, stepped out of the ivory palaces and into this world of sin to effect redemption for us, the one who was rich beyond all splendor became poor for our sake. The incarnation then is a great biblical truth, the central truth of Christianity that God the creator entered into his creation and becomes like his creatures to redeem all of creation itself. The prophets spoke of it. The apostles proclaimed it. Church fathers fought over it and debated it and wrote creeds about it. The incarnation illuminates our need, illuminates God's design for our salvation and his eternal purpose and glory. This evening we will look at the wonder of the incarnation, the importance of the incarnation and the goal of the incarnation as we see who Christ is, what he did, where he went, and what he gives to his people. So then the incarnation discovers or discloses to us first who Christ is, who is the savior. The word Christ is God in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The incarnation we find from this text is not the divine son's beginning. The virgin conception and birth in Bethlehem is not the beginning of the Son of God. Rather, it marks the eternal Son entering physically into our world and becoming one of us. Here, our text speaks of his eternal existence with the Father. In the beginning was the Word. It speaks of his eternal relationship with God. God, where the word was with God, and that by nature, he truly is God. And the word was God. He is revealed to be, in these verses, the creator of all things, the possessor and imparter of life, and the true light, verses five, four and five. He was the true light, verse nine, who comes into the world. Isaiah 9, 2, the prophet Isaiah declares that the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. That light, according to 9, 6, is a child who is born, a son who is given. The one who was in the world, John 1, 10, he came into this world. He left heaven. He humbled himself. He condescends as Paul writes in Romans, he condescends to men of low estate, but the world does not know him. The world does not receive him, verse 11. But to those who did receive him, who do receive him, to those who believe in his name, he grants to us and to them the right to be God's children. He grants us new birth. Our new birth, verse 13, tells us it's not of blood. 
your parents or your family can't believe for you. Our new birth comes not of the will of the flesh. Your friends, your pastor, your church leaders cannot believe for you. Your new birth comes not of the will of man. You do not have the ability even to will to believe yourself. This new birth comes because God wills it to be so. And the wonder of the incarnation is that it was God's design and purpose that we have this new birth. And so to accomplish it, he sent his only son. It is not the will of man, but God's will. Our observance of Christ's advent declares that salvation is God's work alone. And yet none of that is possible apart from the truth of the incarnation. It was John Murray who wrote, the doctrine of incarnation is, incarnation is vitiated or spoiled if it is conceived of as the beginning to be of the person of Christ. The incarnation means that he who never began to be in his specific identity as the son of God began to be what he eternally was not. And so, and so as we come to verse 14, we see then the wonder of the incarnation. The wonder of the incarnation in what Christ did. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. What did the Savior become? The word was made flesh. Christ became man. God became man. He became what he was not, flesh. Yet he became this without ceasing to be what he eternally was, God. The incarnation shows Jesus' humility. Jesus is no typical king. Jesus did not come to be served. In Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man does not come to serve, but to be served and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus came to serve. His humility, humility was on full display from the beginning to the end, from Bethlehem to Golgotha. Paul glories in the humility of Christ when he writes in Philippians that though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being, for, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Someone has written that no external compulsion moved the word to become flesh. He took our flesh of his own free will and deliberately to accomplish our salvation. Oh, the wonder of the incarnation that God would stoop to become like us, that he might redeem us. Well, we come then to the importance of the incarnation, where Christ went. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Christ lived with men. Emmanuel, God with us. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Where did the Savior go? He dwelt among us. He came to this earth. R.C. Sproul wrote, Jesus had a true human nature and was perfectly, that was perfectly united with his divine nature. Christ's humanity is the basis of his identification for us. And that identification, his incarnation, is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament prophecies, certainly the fulfillment of that Old Testament text that was read this evening. Isaiah 9, 6. The incarnation isn't random or accidental. It was predicted in the Old Testament and in accordance with God's eternal plan. Perhaps the clearest text predicting the Messiah 
that he would be both human and God is Isaiah 9, 6. To us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In this verse, Isaiah sees a son that is to be born, and yet he is no ordinary son. His extraordinary names, the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, these names point to his deity. And taken together, the son being born and his names point him to being the God-man, Jesus Christ. The incarnation fulfills prophecy, but the incarnation remains mysterious. The scriptures do not give us answers to all our questions. Some things remain mysterious. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. Certainly the New Testament writers speak or write about the Incarnation. They record the truth of his incarnation. John writes of it again in 1 John 4, 2 and in 2 John 7 where he speaks of Christ's coming in the flesh. Paul writes in Romans that Jesus was sent in the flesh, Romans 8, 3, that Christ appeared in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3, 16, and that he made reconciliation in the body of his flesh. Colossians 1, 21 and 22. In Galatians 4, Paul writes that God sent forth his son born of a woman and that Christ made, made peace by abolishing the enmity in his flesh. Ephesians 2, 15. The writer of Hebrews declares that Jesus had to share in flesh and blood chapter 2, verse 14, that he had to be made like his brothers, 2.17, and of the days of his flesh, Hebrews 5.7. The apostle Peter writes that Jesus suffered in the flesh, 1 Peter 4.1, and that he died in the flesh, 1 Peter 3.18. Oh, how important it is that the second person of the Godhead became flesh, yet how mysterious it is. May we wonder, stand in wonder and awe and worship of this great thing which he has done for us. Answering how it could be that one person could both fully, could be both fully God and fully man is not a question that the scripture focuses on. It does remain a mystery Yet, it is a revealed truth of the Holy Scripture. And so, though we see it taught in sacred writing, how it all works out remains a mystery. The early church fathers certainly believed in the incarnation. Irenaeus wrote, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, because of his surpassing love towards his creation, humbled himself to be born of a virgin. He himself united man to God through himself. Clement of Alexandria said, Our loving Lord became man for us. And so many other examples from the early church fathers could be brought to bear. But the early church fathers preserved this mystery at the Council of Chalcedon in 451 when they wrote that Jesus is recognized in two natures, God and man, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation, the distinction of natures being in no way annulled by union, but rather the characteristics of each nature being preserved and coming together to form one person, not as parted or separated into two persons, but one and the same, Son and only begotten, God 
the word, Lord Jesus Christ. We have seen the importance, the wonder, and now the goal of the incarnation. What Christ gives us. The goal of the incarnation is our very salvation. The incarnation is necessary for salvation. The incarnation of Jesus does not save by itself, but it is an essential link in God's plan of redemption. John Murray explains that the blood of Jesus is the blood that has the requisite efficacy and virtue only by reason of the fact that he who is the Son, the effulgence of the Father's glory and the express image of his substance, became himself also a partaker of flesh and blood, and thus was able by one sacrifice to perfect all those who are sanctified. The author of Hebrews writes that Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. The incarnation displays the greatness of God. Our God is the eternal God who was born in a stable. Not a distant, withdrawn God. Our God is a humble, giving God, not a selfish, grabbing God. He thought it not robbery, something to be grasped, to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Our God is a purposeful, planning God, not a random reactionary God. Our God is a God who is far above us and whose ways are not our ways. He is not a God we can put in a box and control. Our God is a God who redeems us by his blood, not a God who leaves us in our sin. Our God is great indeed. And John writes, and we beheld his glory. His people see his glory. What does this Savior give his people? The ultimate joy of the Christian is the beatific vision, that day when we shall see him face to face, and when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, we will see him in his glory, and we too shall be glorified like him. The ultimate joy of the Christian is the beatific vision, that day when we see him, and we shall be like him. And we catch a glimpse of that glory as we see him and understand him in his incarnation. So Christmas is the observance of that first advent of Christ. When God became man, when he took upon himself our flesh, our nature, and he set upon the great work of redemption. In a few moments, we'll partake of the Lord's table in this blessed sacrament, we proclaim the Lord's incarnation, his life, his death, his resurrection, until he comes. There is a second advent still to come. This same incarnate Christ will return for his chosen people. He will gather to himself those whom he has redeemed with his precious blood. And like John, we are called to bear witness about the light. We receive grace and glory that we might believe and that we might carry the message to those who need to hear it. Christmas is our observance of Christ's first advent when Christ was veiled in flesh. And there is an advent yet to come when every eye shall the Godhead see and hail the incarnate deity. May we in the days ahead, in the midst of the season's hustle and bustle, in the midst of trees and cookies and commercialism and family gatherings, may we be careful to remember the glorious truths of his incarnation. For our sake and for our salvation, he who was rich beyond all splendor 
left heaven's glory and died for our redemption. He rose from the dead and has ascended into heaven to prepare a place for us. And he is coming again. And we are living between the advents. Shall we pray? Indeed, Lord, we are living between the advents. We praise you for the truth of the incarnation. And we stand in awe and wonder that God, the eternal God, became flesh and was made like us that he would redeem us as his people forever. We praise you, Father, for this great work of redemption. We praise you for giving your son to redeem us from our sin. And we ask now that as we contemplate that great work through the sacrament ahead that we might be drawn close to you. Give us of your grace, we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen.